السلام عليكم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأهل بيته وأزواجه وذريته أجمعين أما بعد as Muslims we are different values and we are different etiquettes in which the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he have taught us and because of those etiquettes that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have taught us we have become different in that had the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not given us those guidelines and not told us how to do things then we could only imagine how we would have been we would have been just like anybody else and we ourselves sometimes when we look at people sometimes you will say that can they behave better than that if that's the only thing that they can do looking at the things that they actually do the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one of his beautiful teachings he says to us he says at-tuhuru shatrul iman that tuhur and purity is shatrul iman is a big portion of iman subhanallah he has connected purity and faith in one he has connected being pure and being a Muslim in one. Both of them, they go hand in hand. Both of them, they are connected to each other in such a way, if one doesn't exist, then you become defective on the other side. And we can take an example to understand. If it is with regards to wuzu, we don't wash our elbows properly, although we wash majority of our limbs, we have no salat. It needs to be washed straight until. If a portion of our face is left out, we have no salat. So therefore the actions in Islam is connected towards the simple thing of taharat. However, sometimes when it is we hear the word taharat and we hear purity, the only thing that we think about sometimes is only wudu or only ghusl. However, purity in Islam is way more than that. Example, Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, they used to come for Jumu'ah salat. And when they used to come for Jumu'ah Salat, at that time, Masjid al-Nabawi wasn't very big. It was very small and the roof was also very low. And because it's a day of gathering and they come, normally perspiration, people will naturally sweat. Not the days of ACs or fans or all of those things. So therefore, they will normally perspire and they will normally sweat. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, that on the days of Isdiham and on the days of crowds, make sure and take a ghusl before you come for Jumu'ah Salat. Make sure that you take a bath before you even come for Jumu'ah Salat. So therefore he was teaching them cleanliness, not for Salat itself in that. Their Salat was correct and their Salat was good without that bath. But he was teaching them general taharat and general hygiene. Today we may look at it and be, as being something insignificant because we grew up with it. But the teachings, they came, but if it is we were to look back at history, those things didn't exist in that. Water wasn't available like how it is today. Those were the days of wells and the days of little bit of water that they had to ration and use throughout the day. However, still, despite those conditions, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still taught the Sahaba that when you all come for Jumu'ah Salat, make sure that you all take a ghusl, make sure that you all take a bath before you come. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his teaching towards cleanliness wasn't limited towards ghusl and wudu alone. Rather, it was connected towards different things. For instance, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught about the clipping of the nails. That make sure that you shorten your nails and make sure that that doesn't exceed or doesn't lengthen to such an extent that more than 40 days were to pass without you even clipping the nails. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught cleanliness at different levels. With regards towards the unwanted hair from the pubic regions, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught about its removal. That remove them, it's part and it's connected towards your taharat and it's connected towards your purity. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it wasn't only about this wudu and ghusl, rather he taught the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala to do miswak. One time that he taught them to do miswak was at the time of wudu, but continuously the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself used to be brushing his teeth. Continuously he will be using the miswak right through the day. 
so much so that he thought that it will become even compulsion, it will become something in the deen that we will have to do because the amount of time that Jibreel alayhi salam will tell him a hey, continuously keep doing the miswa. So taharat and purity is not restricted and not limited only towards those things. And I'll explain that taharat is not only with regards towards our body alone. For instance, when we stand for salat, we have to ensure that our clothing are also clean. That it must be in a state that is not defiled. So much so that if a little bit, majority of our garments may be clean. And one little bit of our garment, one little end, just have a little bit of urine, you cannot perform salat with that. Apart from our garments alone and our bodies, we are taught as well that the places that we perform salat, those areas and those places must also be clean as well. We are told as well and we are taught, make sure that your surroundings are kept clean. Make sure that every single thing is kept clean. So much so there is for the and virtues for even cleaning the masjid. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once a woman had died. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he noticed when he came to masjid that the masjid wasn't looking at how it used to look. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inquired, where is the person who used to clean the masjid? Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala told the Nabi of Allah that she died last night and we did her burial etc. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, why didn't you all come and tell me? The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba responded that we didn't want to disturb you because it was very late in the night. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba, point out to me which is her grave. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went and he actually prayed for her again. Why? Because of doing taharat and cleaning the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So taharat and cleaning is not only limited and we restrict it sometimes to only a few things. Rather taharat is very, very big and very, very detailed. Ulama explain though, with regards to taharat and purity, this type of purity, sometimes we see and we look at it as being the only type of purity that exists. But this type of purity that's here, it's only a physical type of purity that exists with regards towards our external body and clothes and place, etc. It's only a physical type of purity that exists. However, there is way more than that. Umar radiallahu ta'ala, sometimes Umar radiallahu ta'ala will even take water from Christian and from different people who are not even Muslims to make wudu. Or let me explain under that, that they look at what's the external purity as important, but not as important as other types of purity. Other types of purity, they still within themselves recognize it to be of a very elevated and a very high status. Well, let me explain that another type of purity that's there, it's that purity of the limbs of the body with regards towards ma'asi and with regards towards sins. That we protect the limbs of our bodies from being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a purity as well. Because while people may perform wudu and take the best of ghusl, adorn the best of clothing and the sweetest of perfume, they can still harm people in so many different ways. They can steal from people and usurp from people. Their eyes may be all over the place in places that the eyes should not be. Their ears are in sin. Their tongues are in sin. All the rest of the limbs of their bodies are coupled in sin. Therefore, Alamari explained that's a level of purity as well. That while you physically remain pure, these parts of your body must also remain pure as well. Once a man came into the gathering of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala and Uthman radiallahu ta'ala just by looking at him, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala he recognized that his eyes looked at things that he not supposed to look at. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala he pointed out to him. That's why there is one tradition of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where the Nabi of Allah says, Ittaqu firasat al-mu'min. Fear that in sight of a believer, for innahu yara, for certainly he sees binur illa with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why sometimes people they hate to go around big ulama because they think in their minds, maybe he might figure out what it is I'm doing. Maybe he might sense the sins that I'm doing and the sins that are being committed. Or let me explain one way to recognize and see people who are very obedient to see how close and attached they are to the great ulama. The closer they are to the great ulama, that's a sign that maybe they aren't committing as much sin because people normally run away from them. 
And the reason they run away from them, one, is because of the sins they commit, and two, they don't want to hear anything to cause a change in their life. They don't want to hear anything that they will have to come out of that so-called comfort zone that they are in. So therefore, they run away as well. So therefore, this is another thing. To protect and to safeguard the limbs of our bodies from the different ma'asi and from the different sins that are there. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, he said to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, what is modesty? What is modesty? He asked the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala what, about modesty. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and they responded to the Nabi of Allah, O oh, Nabi of Allah, we are modest. Because sometimes we think modesty of just being that little bit of shyness alone. However, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wasn't talking about that type of modesty. Rather, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was talking about modesty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being modest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he went on to explain to them, being modest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to protect the head and whatever the head contains. To protect your head in that, you do not bow down and you do not worship anything except in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what the head contains is the eyes and the ear and the tongue. Make sure that these parts of your body and these important organs, they also remain upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also being modest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says protect the stomach and whatever is contained. The stomach in that we do not consume anything that is haram and anything that is doubtful. Make sure that those things never enter into our stomach. And attached to that is the limbs, the legs and the arms and the private parts. Make sure that those limbs of our bodies never ever commit sin. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was teaching them a different level of taharat and a different level of purity. That they need to elevate and they need to go up. It's not only this ground level of purity alone. Though important and very important, there are levels that are higher than that. This one of preventing our limbs from our, of our bodies from committing sins. A second level of taharat and a second level of purity. Or let me explain a third level of taharat and a third level of purity. That while it is an individual, he may be all in usul and he may be in the best of clothing. White as white can be and smelling as the best of all perfumes that exist. He may be preventing himself from every single type of apparent sin. He doesn't see steel and no stealing can be ever attached to him. Nobody has ever heard him lie. He protects his ears, never listen to anything that is wrong. None of those things can ever, a finger can ever be pointed at him as an individual. Therefore, what kind of sins can he commit then? Sins of the heart. And what are those sins of the heart? Hey, you have pride, you think that you are better than other people. You think that the laws, they are not for you and you look down upon other people. While you perform salat behind the imam front row, that is a condition of the heart. Nobody knows that condition. That's a condition of the inside. And when it is you stay by different individuals, they will tell you that it seems as though something is wrong with you. And we see it in our day-to-day -day life sometimes with regards to different people that we can highlight and we can say, you seem as though, you know, you think that you are better than everybody else. Look at the way that you are speaking and look at the things that you are doing. A quality of the inside. Can it just be apparent and it doesn't seem and it doesn't show up just like that as well? Another quality that's of the inside is fake humility. What's fake humility? A person, he tells you and he comes and he praises you and you say, no, no, I'm not like that. I'm worse than anything. And then he tells you as a rebuttal, yeah, you're really like that. And then you get vexed with him. When it is you get vexed with him, yeah, that's the fake humility is showing up now. Not real humility at all. Actually, you are just, that's a front you are putting up. You are just, you are just, so Allah must say, this is one way to sift it out. To sift out who are the real ones and who are not the real ones. This is one way to sift it out. Not a way to go around doing, but this is a way to sift it out. That fake humility that is within people. Once one, once one alim, he saw a person, he was turning around the shoes outside. You know, just putting it, fixing it. And within his heart, he was thinking to himself that, you know, I'm really elevated in the eyes of Allah because, you know, I'm doing these simple, simple things that nobody wants to do. So maybe Allah is looking at me and I'm thinking myself as being very, very elevated and good. You know, doing simple work, nothing work. So therefore, sometimes we think doing the nothing work brings us real close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Sometimes while they do, at other times they become detrimental. When Alim, he says, stop. Stop what it is you are doing. He says, why? He says, the thought has entered into your heart. And now you are thinking, because of what you are doing, you are better than everybody else now. So because he was doing a simple work, thinking, oh, it's a, nobody else wants to do it. He was thinking to himself and the thought came within him. Now I am better than everybody else because nobody else wants to do it. So therefore that type of fake humility that's there, that inner quality that's there, not dahir and not apparent. It doesn't just manifest itself just like that. Quality is of the inside. That also needs to be purified. That also needs to come out. Another quality that's there of the inside as well is jealousy that people have in their hearts. And jealousy is whereby a person he sees ni'am and he sees favors in other people and he wish that those favors be removed and snatched away from them. When Alim, when it is we went to one workshop, he said to us, he says sometimes when a new stars and a new teacher comes to teach, sometimes all the students, they flock to him sometimes. So therefore in your heart you are thinking, Everybody was to me and everybody used to listen to me. He is the new teacher now who has come and everybody starts to run to him. And now it is you think in your heart and you know you become jealous of him. Why he come to teach for? Look at his qualifications. Mine are better than that. But in reality, I could teach better than him. And all of these thoughts start to run in the heart and start to play in the heart now. And you become jealous of him. And within your heart, you are wishing for him to do something so he can get kicked out. You're wishing in your heart for something to occur so somebody can tell him, hey, you got to leave now. In reality, the Alimi told us, look at it from the other side. He has come to aid you in whatever task you have. That you may have been doing plenty, alhamdulillah and mashallah, but you have brought something different to the battlefield and different to the playground now, wherein it's an enhancement to those who are there. Do not look at it as a detriment, look at it as an enhancement. You may also learn something that you can use as well. So sometimes when we see people moving up and they move away from us as individuals and we were the famous one, sometimes we look at it as being a bad thing. Rather look at it as being a good thing and a positive that this person may help me and I may learn something from him so that I may elevate myself as well. So all of these are conditions of the heart that eat us sometimes. We are not seeing it. You sit down calm and you sit down comfortable, but it's grinding and it's eating out the inside. So this is also a type of purity as well. That need, our hearts need to become purified. So it's not the physical purity of the body, wherein the filth needs to be removed. Neither is it with regards towards the limbs of the body in committing sins. But this one is even deeper than that. This one goes beyond the normal scope and beyond the normal vision. This one goes towards the inside. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ zakkaha." That Successful indeed is that one who purifies himself, that he rids himself of all of these different qualities. He gets these qualities extracted and pulled out from him. He gets these qualities out of himself. Niggardliness and stinginess is a quality like that as well. All of these different qualities of the inside, where it is nobody really recognizes. Nobody really sees it at all, rather they are there. And the person sometimes, he hardly recognizes it. But upon inspection of himself, he might really say, yeah, it's inside, it's there. So this is a third level of tahara that we need to aim for. And the fourth level of tahara, a level even higher than that. And a level that we all aspire to reach is that level of the Anbiya alayhi salam And those who are really, really there and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where they are purified of every single thing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I mean is that all they recognize and all they see in whatever walk of life they go in, they see the jalal and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is said about Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala that Abu Bakr will not see anything except that he will recognize the jalal and the greatness of Allah. Today when we see a mountain, we will see the clouds drop low and we will see the greatness of it and how vast. Our eyes will be quick to pick up, oh look there, they are slashing and burning, and look, piece of the mountain has fell here. Abu Bakr used to see the mountain and he used to recognize, look at my Allah, look at his creation. When it is he used to see the mountains, he used to see the qudrat and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why in the Holy Quran, continuously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us to look. Look at how I've created the heavens and the earth, samawati wal ard. Look at how I have created the sun and the moon. Why? 
Because this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the human eye, they are the most, they are the greatest of creations that our eyes can witness at any given moment in time. That right now we look towards the sky, we see the hugeness and the vastness of the sky. When you see how great the sky is, you are to recognize, look how great the sky is, recognize Allah at the same time. When it is you look at the earth, you stand and you look at how great this earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That Allah has taken every single thing into consideration. Some places Allah has made it to hold water. Other places water will run off. Some places he has made it very, very soft. Other places very, very hard. The earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has made with such perfection for you and I to traverse and live upon. That we will walk upon it, yet still a very soft blue mule can shoot up from it. Such is the qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any one given moment in the day we can recognize. Look how great this one creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah talks about the night. That when the night comes, that's a ni'mat and that's a favor from Allah. Such a favor that we can sleep for the entire day. And the strength we'll gain from day sleep will make us in such a way that we want to go to sleep again. We have slept for the entire day, yet still if you sleep during the day, you want to sleep more. That sleep during the day doesn't bring about the type of rest when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it in the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about such beauty, such tranquility and peace that covers and envelopes every single thing in the night wherein Allah creates an environment for us. Can we think about it for a few moments? Had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sleep only for human beings and not for the animals, what will have been our conditions in the night? The birds scratching on the galvanized and the dogs barking for the entire night. The animals roaming and every single thing hustling and bustling. What will have happened to us as human beings? What will have happened to us? There will have been no rest, but Allah has made the entire place go into tranquility. The entire place goes into rest just for you and I to take a rest. Every single thing is done for who? For you and me. Allah causes the crops to grow for who? You and me. Every single thing occurs just for you and me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during the day, cause only you and I to become active and nothing else to become active, then what will have been the condition of you and I, it will have been so difficult as well. So tedious of a task, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not placed nashat and activeness during the day, can we imagine when we get up in the morning, how will we have felt during the entire day? But there is a natural type of activeness that is filled during the day. This is the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That last type, that highest type, where we recognize in every single thing, we recognize the jalal, and we recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you want to recognize the greatness of yourself, look at yourself. Look at yourself and you're going to see the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A camera, it's if, if it's moved too fast, the, it's not able to capture and it's not able to pick up the pictures properly so much so if different colors are worn the camera can even pick it up our eyes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have built in such a way we will move it across this room hundreds of colors flash before our eyes and we are able to interpret it in one second we are able to comprehend and understand every single thing in just a second this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says look at my creation look at what I have done to you this is just your eye alone can we imagine, had Allah not put taste on our tongues, what will have been our condition? Apart from praising our wives whenever they cook something good, we will not have been able to taste whenever something was bitter and spoiled. We've not been able to do it as well. To taste is a ni'mat from Allah. Can we imagine the sip of milk? Sometimes the expiry date has not even reached yet on a product and yet still it tastes bad. Can we imagine going on the date of the product and consuming such a thing? What will have happened to our health? Had we had no such thing as feelings on our bodies, we will have injured and burnt ourselves. We will have damaged ourselves to such an extent that maybe beyond repair, we will have not been able to get back good again. In order to taste tea sometimes and to make sure that we can sip it, we just put it towards our lip and make sure that our lips can handle it to the tip of our tongues. Can we imagine sipping? 
Can we imagine taking in this tea within our bodies without even being able to do that? I remember once an incident, there was one boy. He didn't like drinking hot tea because hot tea burns his mouth. So one of his friends, he told them, out of a joke, but a serious joke, he says to prevent the burning of your mouth, why don't you drink it with a straw? So when you sip it with a straw, we can only imagine what is actually going to happen. Had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not given us the sensation, what would have happened to us? Subhanallah. Allah says, look at yourselves. Look at yourselves and you will be able to recognize me. Can we imagine had we had no fingernail, how the tips of our fingers will have been? It will have been so soft just like any other parts of our bodies. How will we get that extra little bit of strength at the tip to grip and to hold on? That extra bit of strength to do any little thing. Every single part of our body, it's a favor from Allah. So this is the highest level of taharat and purity. Where we rid ourselves of every single thing except Allah. We only recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, sometimes we concentrate so hard and we make so much effort. And while the efforts are praiseworthy and good, on the last and the lowest level of taharat, and we are unmindful that there are so much levels still to climb. There are so many levels still to climb. That we work hard on our skins to make sure they are soft and supple. Make sure they are smooth and no blisters. We make sure that every single thing, we ensure our manicures and pedicures are done good. We ensure that we have the best of haircuts, etc. Every single thing we ensure, our clothing are good. We smell good. That is praiseworthy and that is good, mashallah. But tahara doesn't end there. That's the beginning of tahara. Purity doesn't end there. That's actually the beginning of purity. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these few words, subhanallah, Nabi of Allah is jawami wal kalim. He says three words and it means a whole bayan. At-tuhuru shaturul iman, three words, purity is part of iman, it's part of faith. So as Muslims, taharat is connected to us being as Muslims. Whatever part of purity there is, hold on to it, grab on to it and excel in purity. Allah commends those people in the Holy Quran who exert themselves in being pure. Well, let me explain. Muslims, they become to such a degree that when they use the washroom and any sort of defilement that comes about them, they feel within themselves that they are impure and there is that need to make wudu. Well, let me explain. This is taharat. Where it is you feel within yourselves with that natural instinct that's there within you, you don't like to ever be without wudu. You love to be in wudu all the time. This is a praiseworthy quality. This is an angelic quality because the angels are those who are pure all the time. So going ahead and being zealous and enthusiastic of always having wudu, that's a great quality. That's an angelic quality. And that's a quality we could inculcate within ourselves as well to always be in a state of taharat. Wherever you are on the road, salah time reaches, you can pray, you are always pure. You need to recite a little Quran, you are always pure. It doesn't matter what state you are in, you are always in a state of purity. And it brings about a state of calmness within yourself as well. Because impurity makes you restless. Purity brings about calmness within you. So therefore, endeavor to become pure. Imagine the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that before you sleep, make wudu. Before you sleep, be in a state of taharat. For if you were to die tonight, at least your last condition will have been how? Pure, subhanallah. Your last condition will have been how? Pure. When it is a person die and they are going back to Allah, what do we do with them? Ghusl. They are given ghusl, going back to Allah, pure. Purity is connected to us from beginning to end. Every single part of us is pure. So as Ramadan is coming to an end, we are people who need to endeavor to be pure, not only in this low level, but be pure in all levels. So therefore, as Ramadan is there, sometimes we feel that ta'alluq and that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that comes about because we have been staying away from sins for quite a considerable amount of days. That we feel good when we perform salat. When we read Quran, we feel to read more Quran. Whatever ibadat we do, we get a sweetness in it. That sweetness comes about because we are not in any type of evil at all. Shaitan is not even tempting us at all. This is a Ramadan and this is what Ramadan brings about. The type of purity that comes about. The type of calmness that comes about. But as soon as that moon is sighted, well, all hell breaks loose because all the shayateen are going to come back now. 
All the wasawis and all the whisperings are going to come back. So purify yourselves good. The Nabi of Allah says, as siyamu jannatun. Have that shield, hold on to that shield. Make sure that we are always in a state of purity. And when I say purity now, we understand the states of purity. Not just only being physically pure, be pure from sins, be pure from internal sicknesses, and earn an endeavor to be pure to that extent that we only recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that when it is the battle zone comes back again, we are able to stand against our open enemy. We are able to stand with weapons in hand. We are able to stand with enough enforcement and with enough and with enough protection to defend ourselves from whatever comes our way. We are able to protect ourselves and we are able to protect those around us as well from shaitan and from our own evils as well. I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He grants us all the levels of purity. I hope and pray that Allah bless us, He accepts us, and He makes us Ramadan a change in Ramadan. May Allah grant us tawfiq to practice. Wa akhir da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salamu Yeah.